Hi, I'm Sophia Louisa Lee. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of So Zoom In. Please hit like and subscribe. I greatly appreciate it. I love bringing you people who are in the creative flow. Today, I'm bringing you Pamela J. Smith. She is an amazing writer, screenwriter, writer, director, producer, and she is a mythologist. So we will find out more about that. So thank you for joining us. Pamela, hi. Hello there. How nice to see you again. So nice to see you. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Um, oh, I'm very pleased and honored to be invited. Thank you. Such a joy to see you again. And thank you so much for being on my show. Well, thank you. I've been doing well. I'm very fortunate to have some really interesting projects and wonderful clients. So working on a number of stories that are really addressing issues that a lot of people are facing these days, whether it's historical stories or contemporary or fantasy. So a lot of people um, that I get to work with are really working on bringing information and insights to other people and uh, to, while they're telling good stories. So it's a lot of fun to work on those. And then I'm working on some of my own projects also that are very interesting and fulfilling. So do it well. Thank you. Well, it sounds like you've always been doing very fascinating projects. You know, you have four books that you have in publication right now. Did I get that right? Four or do you have more? Um, actually, there are more, four of them through uh, initially Michael Weesey Productions. Okay. And they're a wonderful publishing company and they do uh, really great film business books. And then I have uh, put out uh, three others on my own with my own publishing company, and that's in the nonfiction. And then I have an anthology out so far of some fiction short stories and some more in the works. See, very exciting stuff. Now, one of the things that I have to say I absolutely adore about you is you're a mythologist. mythologist. That's it. That's it. I'm, yes. I'm thinking you're all into mythology. And I think about, you know, Zeus and all these different and all different cultures, actually, where there's always mythology for every different culture. But what got you started into studying or learning more about mythology? Well, um, I, I enjoyed telling about this. I first came across mythology in the fifth grade. And our teacher, after lunch, would have all of us come in and lay our little heads down on the desk. And uh, so she could have some quiet time, but she would read to us out of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And during that entire year of my fifth grade, she read to us both books and they're just, you know, jammed packed with all this wonderful storytelling and adventures and the gods and the heroes and the challenges. And, um, uh, I grew up in a small town in Texas, and I found a lot of the stories familiar, like rigged beauty contests and people cheating on each other and, you know, revenge. And so I thought, oh, this is great. They keep a lot of good stories here in this mythology stuff. Those same type of stories are still happening on a grand scale, too. You know? Aren't they? Aren't they just? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So pretty much everything that you've learned over the years, you incorporate into your writing about mythology. Is that, would you agree with that or? Yes, into uh, my own writing and into uh, teaching. And I did um, study the classics at university. I took a degree in uh, English and in Latin. So got exposed to even more of the classical stories and then um, I always just had an interest in it and followed it up on my own. I was taking some courses at the Philosophical Research Society here in Los Angeles. And I studied with a, a teacher of the ageless wisdom, Georgia Lambert. And she's really fabulous. If anybody's interested in learning more about the ageless wisdom, the physics of metaphysics, the chakras, Theosophy, Mystic Christianity, Rosicrucianism, Masonry, etc. She's got it all. Oh, yeah. And so one of her assignments for us was, okay, now I want you to take what you've been learning in this class and put it into your business. And at the time I was uh, producing and directing commercials and uh, aerospace and military films. And thought, how the heck am I going to put 
any of this into that. It was pretty obvious after not much thought that um, it's all about creating characters, even in nonfiction and even in promotional films. You need to have a good storyline and you need to have good characters and you can find all of those patterns in mythology. So then I put together my company MythWorks and started developing that up into something that uh, other people could use in the in the way of uh, mythic themes and archetypes and symbols. And it's just been a really, really interesting process over the years. Well, that's wonderful. And it it does fit into everything, it seems like. And we see in commercials even. From my understanding, you also worked with companies through MythWorks, or was it were you using this type of foundation to aid your teaching when you did work with different companies? Um, a bit of both. And uh, I've been really fortunate in my media industry career to have, uh, oh gosh, worked in many different aspects. I've spent four years in production at Universal Studios and then went freelance and worked on uh, commercials and documentaries and music videos and military films, uh, corporate films, and got to travel all around the world doing it. So it's, uh, it's been really wonderful. And it's always been so interesting to see how we keep telling the same stories in different versions all across time and all across cultures. And that's how you, as a storyteller, can make your product more universally understandable and acceptable, like accessible rather, if you uh, use these mythic tools, the themes, archetypes, and symbols, because everybody has them. Right, they do. And, and we use them every day, it seems like, you know, even if we don't really realize it. So I first of all, I love that you're part of this. And I remember um, a while ago, I watched um, a series of webinar or a series of digital content based on Egypt. And I was so excited wow. to see you be a part of that. I'm like, that's Pamela oh, J. Smith. Yeah. And oh, goodness. how did you come to be part of something like that? And um, is that something that you are going to continue being part of? Well, it, it is a wonderful series. I must compliment the creators, um, Chance, Gardner and, uh, Chance Gardner and Venice McNeil, who created uh, the great work, which I was in. And um, the teacher I mentioned earlier, uh, Georgia Lambert, is in that also, as well as a number of other people who, uh, John Anthony West and you know other e Egypt experts and uh, experts in other fields. They also did a wonderful series called Magical Egypt. Yes. And I was not in that one, but I just rewatched it for research on a fiction thing I'm working on. It is fabulous. The information in there is just mind blowing to hear about and see how advanced the sciences were in ancient Egypt and how well they articulated those principles into their architecture and into their religion, their initiatory systems. Just amazing. And it's so interesting that it just like all disappeared. You know, it's like all of it's gone. And I heard someone say, well, you know, that's what civilizations do. You know, they rise and they fall. And it's like this perpetual cycle of rising and falling. Would you agree with that? Um, yes and a lot of what the Egyptians did is still there you can still see it and more is being uncovered every day when your civilization creates giant temples and the temples themselves in their architecture contain wisdoms and I have something here to show this is a book called The Temple in Man it's by Schwaller de Lubitz who did a lot of work in symbolism and, and Egyptology. And um, it shows the design, the floor plan of one of the temples. And on top of it is a human shape. 
to show that the temple was built, designed and built to reflect the human shape. In its in its proportions, uh, there are also aspects that um, embody the internal structure of the head, and it's in the architecture. So in the case of Egypt, it's not all gone. But yeah, in many other cultures, they do rise and fall, mm-hmm. and a lot of them just disappear beneath the sands. Now, cool, however, is the uh, technology LIDAR, which is an uh, aerial radar system that can look through forests mm-hmm. and through sand through dirt and has been discovering all these fabulously big and complex cities in the jungles of South and Mesoamerica. Oh, wow. That's yeah. Awesome. So the lost civilizations, a lot of them are being found again, which is great. Right. It seems like, it seems like we kind of need this knowledge. You know, it, it's still yes. like everything's rising so fast. And it's like, because I remember like 10 years ago, you know, wanting to learn more about Atlantis or learning more about ancient Egypt. And there's like nothing oh. online. And it seems like you Google it and it, all sorts of stuff pops up, which is really exciting. It seems like there's a thirst for wanting to know more. And what's interesting, it seems like the movie industry or, you know, it seems like script writers are writing a lot more about that, you know, bringing in a lot more of the esotericism, you know, the ancient civilizations, bring it into present time. You know, in, that's, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Do you have any particular examples of that that you like? The Marvel movies, the, the oh. whole series of the Avengers, like Doctor Strange, you're know, talking about, okay, Doctor Strange is my favorite because okay. not so much the comic book, but just the way that he gets into like the sacred geometry, you know, the ancient wisdom of, you know, being able to transport into different portals, messing with time, you know, messing with the timeline. And <laughs> It just seems like that's not new information. You know, it seems like that's all been done before and it's been hidden from us. And I think with writers, you know, we can really express that and really dive into it and kind of sort of be safe. I can't really say completely safe because, you know, I've heard ruffles or can, you know, feathers can be ruffled depending on who who you deal with. Um, But I think it's interesting that bits of information can be, disclosed, if you will, through entertainment. Um, the Ant-Man movie, it's funny because I have friends who are like, you watch the Marvel movies? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> because there's all this like disclosure. Because if you learn more ab- about, it, about it, you know, th- whether it's ancient Egypt or different awakening type material, you, know, you yeah. can see it in these movies. It's cleverly done. So you know, a kid won't get it. They'll Think they're being entertained but just the symbolism you know um the way they talk they talk and it, it's really fascinating and it reminded me so much of mythology too with again with the different archetypes and the different personalities of the different gods and and of course star trek is another one and even star wars and you know it, it, it's just interesting the information that's out there that has always been hidden and it's slowly coming out. Yes. Yes. And that is so wonderful. And I'm going to uh, check out, I haven't seen an Ant-Man movie in quite some time. So I'll check out one of the latest ones. And also Dr. Strange. Thank you for that, um, that, that I, information. I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because like Dr. You know, Dr. Strange is a comic book. Well, the way it's done and the visuals with the sacred geometry and the uh-huh. crystals beautiful just so wonderful wonderful that's that's so great these are times when we need the ageless wisdom and however we can get it out we being you know media people storytellers teachers anybody we really need this so it's great to hear that uh, you're seeing it in a lot of places as well in the popular mode well, you are working on so many things right now. What um, what can you share some things that you're working on currently? One of my own projects. I am hoping to, and I think, oh, hoping to get this out sometime soon. It's a series of linked stories, and it's about a group of souls who reincarnate together 
over different times and places. And their ultimate goal is supposedly to uh, help everyone become enlightened and evolved. But uh, sometimes not everybody's on track. And some go over to the dark side. Mm -hmm. And you never really know who's doing what. And so the first of the stories is coming out uh, hopefully this month. And they're novella length. Mm -hmm. And then they, but they all tie together and there'll be five of them. And um, one is set in the American Midwest in uh, the 1950s with a bunch of gangsters of all things. And uh, one's in the future in Australia. One is in uh, Vienna, Austria in the 1900s. And so it's, it's been a lot of fun doing the research and trying to tie all the different pieces together. It's been a real challenge, but I've really been enjoying it. And I've been learning an awfully lot too. Well, that sounds very exciting. It sounds like you'd make a great series. I hope so. Yes, that would be <laughs> nice. <laughs> Well, it's, it's fascinating that you mentioned soul groups, because I'm starting to hear a lot more about that, too, because it seems, again, uh, like a few years ago, it wasn't really something you heard about in the general populace. Um, yeah. But it's really, it's great that you know, you're talking about it. I, I believe in it. I believe everyone we meet or encounter, we've had some sort of relationship with, you know, in a different lifetime, or, you know, it's like, energy constantly moves and goes. And um, so I, I think that's fascinating that people are starting to awaken to it. And then, then again, you know, I don't know, are you writing this from a place of you really believe this or are you writing it from a place that this is fascinating and would make great writing material? Okay. Um, and admission. Yes. I used to believe in reincarnation. Okay. And I found it fascinating and helpful in figuring out at times what to do in relationships and situations, sometimes not. Mm. And um, I don't so much these days, mm. but that's just part of, it's something you can't really prove. It's like any afterlife theory you can't prove it one way or another because it's, it's a door beyond which you cannot see, right. even with near-death experiences, etc. However, it's a marvelous tool for storytelling. It's also a very helpful tool for dealing with questions that otherwise seem to have no answer. Mm -hmm. And I think it can be a very hopeful philosophy mm -hmm. to better empower positive relationships. On the downside, it can also be used to oppress people, to deny them their rights, to say, hey, if you're suffering, that's your karma. You must have been horrible in some other lifetime. I don't owe you anything and I don't have to help you. <laughs> you know, hey, if you're if if you aren't being favored by the gods, that's your fault. That's so interesting. I would see how people like no matter what it is, people always turn it into their favor. You know what I mean? It's like, no matter what, you know, yeah. instead of saying, yeah. okay, this could, you know, this could be a potential possibility. You know, let's say, let's say it really is, you know, kind of like the multi, multiple, um, the multiverse. Well, the multiverse. Yeah. Multiverse, yeah. Right. Uh -huh. So who knows, you know, but whatever it is for you, that's your journey. That's your world. And it's like, okay, karma, whatever I, you know, cool you know it's like um but there's always going to be that one person who wants to have you under his or her thumb or the oppression no matter what no matter what and and again that makes for a great story you know it's like oh, yeah and it's funny because you see what's going on in life and you know, people can be in such denial about stuff but yet turn around and watch a movie that's exactly what's happening in life like oh that's a great movie without any clues to <laughs> what's really happening yeah uh yeah it's amazing. It's amazing. I was having a, a very interesting discussion with a, another friend who is in, in the business. And we were talking sort of about something similar and uh, recalled the phrase, I think it's from the New Testament, but maybe it's from Proverbs in the Old Testament. There are none so blind as those who will not see. And there are none so deaf as those who will not hear. 
So often, like you were saying, people see, but they just don't want to. Right. And they hear a truth, but they don't want to deal with what it would mean if they actually took it to heart. So yeah, human nature. Right. It's fascinating. And and how we go on this journey of hopefully expansion, you know, and yeah. gain wisdom, hopefully. But um, who knows? Who really knows? But I just yeah. love... I just love this journey you've been on because you've, you know, the way everything you've, you've delved into it and you expand your own consciousness by learning and then by sharing and by teaching and, you know, then also the writing and the directing, the producing, you, you do all of it. And I am so inspired by that. So I have to say, thank you. you. Well, thank you. That's, that's nice to hear. And it's been um, really interesting, and I've learned so much and have met wonderful people and gotten to go amazing places and see and do things. And And it's great to be able to pass it on to, to you know, give back. And I see so many of our colleagues doing that, whether it's at the various film festivals or story conferences or uh, putting out books or teaching or doing podcasts, uh, to be sharing the information. And it's wonderful that there's the technology to do even more of that these days. And thank you for what you're doing. And I've looked at some of your uh, podcasts also and really enjoyed getting those different perspectives. Right. Well, there's so many different types of perspectives out there. And I know not everything resonates with everyone. And to me, that's, that's kind of the fun of it to see how everyone has their own path. And yet we all, you know, we all want to learn. We all want to do. And I I think that's very exciting. And, and what, and you just, you just do everything with such grace and with such, with such beauty and I, and such beautiful wisdom. And I, I, I love that. I love that. So you're, are you still teaching right now? Yes, I am. Now, hopefully We're going to be doing a lot more in-person teaching. So, you know, most of it's been on Zoom for the last couple of years. But uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be presenting the archetypes, the arc paths, to a group of uh, film students from Denmark who come over to Hollywood. Their professor brings them over every year, some of his students, to uh, learn about the film industry in Hollywood. And he usually has me come in and talk about the chakras or the archetypes. And it's always a real pleasure. Oh, that's great. Well, what a bonus for them, because not only can they apply it to their characters, but they can use it for themselves as well to really. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That, that's to me so much of the fun about working with the, uh, the arc paths and the chakras is um uh, your own self-awareness and development, and then also seeing other people that you are interacting with and going, oh, geez, they're doing lower solar plexus today. Just don't even try to reason with them. It's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> or, oh, yeah, oh, that's going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Lower chakras, walk away. <laughs> yeah. So do you do that when you say you're out people watching or you're out in public? Do you ever just automatically? pick up on, pick up on that? Or do you just Mm -hmm. kind of tune it? Oh, no, absolutely. Pick up on it. Absolutely. And of course, you know, this implies judgment. Um, So it's more from a writer's perspective, because Mm -hmm. you never know, unless you know somebody really well. And even then you don't really know anybody, you know, what's really going on inside of them in their heart and their soul and their spirit. And, but it certainly makes for interesting observations. And, and and that's just, I think observing is a much more active word than judging because it seems like yeah yeah and um, well you're not really judging I mean you know even no, if you no, think, not really you're assessing you're right you, yeah assessing. observing and assessing well because as a creative you're constantly you constantly have to do that you know you log it you know, for future writings or it seems like it's like we keep this database in our minds like, oh, okay, I need, I didn't remember that for, you know, this is going to be good for something that hasn't popped into my head yet, but it'll come. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, it's also very good in your uh, personal group dynamics, and particularly if you're in a leadership position, to quickly assess, let's say, which of the five archipaths a person might be operating on, warrior, magician, scientist, clergy, or lover, or where they are in the chakras. If they're really upset, then you know, okay, well, maybe you need to do something that's more uplifting for them. If there's somebody who's very much in their throat chakra, then you want to speak to them intellectually. And if someone is, uh, let's say, more in the aspirational solar plexus, then you want to inspire them to participate in the project because think of all the good that it will do. So it helps to get a sense of where people are in order to better communicate with them. And uh, that's actually something I was uh, teaching in a military think tank some years ago as a a leadership skill that people can develop and utilize quite effectively. Is that something that can be picked up quite quickly or does that sometimes take a while for people to fully grasp? It kind of depends on what kind of background they have already. If someone is new to esoterics, if they're new to metaphysics, it may take a while. So an interesting thing in uh, metaphysics and reincarnation called uh, recapitulation. And the theory is that you come into your particular lifetime here and now, but you've had all these others where you've developed these other skills and you've already done the scientist arc path. You've already done the warrior. And this time you're the magician. But there may be a time in your life earlier on, perhaps, that you were interested in science or you were interested in military history or you know whatever. And you touch base with your past and you recapitulate it sometimes in a couple of months, sometimes in a couple of years. And then you've got it. You've tapped into it again. And then you can go on and further develop your magician archipath. And that's something that um, when I do personal myth consultations for people, that's what we do is to look at where they've been and where they are and where they're going. So it's not difficult to grasp the information. And you can also spend years and years diving more deeply into it and learning more about it. But people can get it. They could get the concepts in a you know, 45 minute lecture and then go off and observe and try it out themselves. Do you still do these consultations for people? Mm -hmm. If someone someone wanted to do that, how would they contact you or can, can people reach out to you and say, I'd like to try this? Oh, absolutely. They can go to my website, which is mythworks.net M-Y-T-H-W-O-R-K-S dot net or Pamela J Smith dot com. And they can read about the archipaths mm-hmm. and there's quite a bit there. And then they can be in touch. And for that or for story consultations or any of our, you know, pitch assistance, we do offer a free 20 minute consult for people just to chat about what it is they're looking for and see if it's something we can help them with, or we might then send them to one of our other colleagues if it seems like it would be a better fit. When you say story consultations, what exactly do you mean by that? For a script or a novel or anything? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, script, novel, anything. And I'm working with a client who's uh, got a novel, another who's doing um, romantic comedy feature script, Uh, Another who's doing a short film and somebody else with a fantasy series. And those are just some of them. The neat thing about the mythic themes, archetypes, and symbols, they apply anywhere. So they really do. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And basically what I do is assess where, where the story is and what story it looks like the person is trying to tell. And then offer them these mythic tools to help them better align with the story that they apparently have been inspired, if you will, to write. Would, could, would you mind giving an example 
of a type of story like like say let's we'll take a horror movie you know like say and um, do, do you really watch horror movies you probably don't <laughs> oh, I try to avoid them you know I know. I know they're popular and they serve a purpose absolutely but I just don't want to go there okay but you do have a book about how to write good dark scary characters yeah yeah I know <laughs> it's <laughs> But if we can write stories that are more uplifting or more about the about the hero's journey, mm-hmm. I, I think it really change consciousness. And I think that's what you are doing with your writings, with your work. I, I, I think you're putting it out there. Thank you. I, I certainly hope to. And, uh, you know, once again, I didn't invent these things, but I'm really tickled to be able to present them in certain ways to people that they can then use in their own storytelling. And I, I think you're right. We've got to, we've got to figure out a way to be more effective in creating more positive change more quickly these days when it is that, that phase change between the the age of Pisces going out and the age of Aquarius coming in. And anytime you have two diverse energies meeting, there's always going to be a lot of conflict. That's just physics. So figuring out how we can make it uh, less uncomfortable and less deadly for more people, the better. Right. And yet we have... uh... Oh my gosh. And yet people are so quick to want to blow each other up, you know? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll admit to that. Okay. Driving in Los Angeles. I'll admit to that. I often wish I had a laser on my car, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not to really permanently hurt somebody, but just kind of, you know, <laughs> get them out of the way. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, and saying, so- be polite. Don't cut people off. I think it's because people don't know how to tune into themselves. And I, I think that could go very well oh, yeah. to chakras, you know, because when you know your chakras and you are in alignment, you know, and you clear your blockages, you're much more aware and yes, conscious of what's around you. So, so when you're working with someone on romantic comedy, do you pretty much stick with the archetypes or do you just really do it purely as to the story and, and what you see based on your knowledge, how to about best serve that story? It's a combination of both. It will be, um, first of all, identify their mythic theme, whether it's stealing fire from heaven with, you know, Prometheus bringing fire from the gods down to the humans, or whether it's lost love rescued, the story of Orpheus and Eurydice, and they get separated and she goes, she dies and she goes into the underworld and he goes down to hopefully rescue her and bring her back and in some versions it ends well and in others it doesn't but it's about the reunification of the masculine and feminine energies and then there's the wake-up call like you know luke skywalker or um arthur pulling the sword out of the stone and then he recognized as the king and many other particularly coming of age stories are the wake up call theme and there's the war in heaven theme there's the great escape theme you know hero's journey is not the only mythic theme so it's helping people identify what is the theme of their story what's the message as you earlier said that they're trying to put out there and each of those themes has oh a dozen or so plot points that you'll find in the myths that have been told and the movies and operas and novels that have been written on that theme over the years so that they can touch upon half a dozen of them and you plug into that energy, you plug into that musical chord, that geometric form, if you will, going back to sacred geometry. Mm. And then once you've done that, things start to fit together more easily. And then identifying the uh, characters' archetypes, their archipaths that they're on, oftentimes they'll be real clear, but sometimes they're not. But if you just identify what seems to be the strongest one and then give people tools to bring that out more strongly, 
in the style of speaking, the style of acting, what are the words they use, what is the the mission. Then they can create their characters so that they're each more diverse one from the other. So you have more interesting characters. And then symbols. You know, how to use symbols in your storytelling, because people have been doing that for hundreds of thousands of years. Right. Even when it seems very subtle or mm-hmm. right. Yeah, the nice thing about symbolism is you don't have to know it to get it. Mm-hmm. But if you do know it, then you go, oh, yeah, I get that. Okay. Well, the movie that comes to mind right away is um, The Da Vinci Code, because that whole movie was oh, about yeah. That was like really in your face. But what do you yeah. say? Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but we see pretty much all movies use some sort of symbolism. I think just by the very nature of the visual medium, yes. And that can be in the choice of what color dress a person is wearing. Uh, are you shooting at night exterior or day exterior? Is the room small? Are there flowers in it? You know, what kind of car are they driving? All those choices give us a sense of the character, what's going on, and uh, what's likely to happen. So, yeah, I think uh, even if, now, I think directors and production designers are, are pretty pretty good at this, production designers in particular. And some directors may not realize that's what they're doing when they first start out, but uh, they'll have a vision. And the ones who use it well, one of my favorite films about that, well, two of my favorite films are uh, Lawrence of Arabia and Apocalypse Now. Mm -hmm. And they both use nature and human creations and human uh, portrayals to really get across the messages. So the symbolism is very rich in both of those. One's in the jungle and one's in the desert. That's right. And they're both amazing movies. Aren't they wonderful? Yeah. I was just visualizing both of them as you mentioned them. It's like <laughs> so well acted too. Um, oh, yes. Yes. So I have to ask, since AI seems to be, you know, rising rapidly, um, even oh. for screen, screenwriting, you know, I talk, was talking to a producer and she was saying that she wants to start using AI even for script writing and then like have a, a person, script writer, you know, fine tune it, oversee it. Um, do you think that's going to take over in the industry? You know, obviously robots aren't going to go away. I mean, there's this no, no, desire no. to like, oh, I'm going to play God and create something. I probably shouldn't, but it sounds cool. You know, we are Terminator <laughs> in the making, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, but it seems like so many people have this, this desire. It's like, oh, I can, I can make a whole movie based on AI starting from script all the way through. Do you think that will actually happen? I think some people will do it. I don't think it's going to be successful. I think it's like, oh, the latest, ooh, ooh, let's everybody do this. Mm-hmm. I saw a cute cartoon the other day, though, Sophia. It was uh, someone sitting in uh, their office, and she's looking at her computer screen, and there's another coworker behind her looking on. And on the computer screen, there's uh, the unhappy face, right. you know, the little smiley with them. And uh, she says to her coworker, well, the AI just become ju- – the." Uh, Art, bot, AI just became sentient. And now all it does is procrastinate and wallow in self-doubt. <laughs> so, no, I think it's a it's a neat trick. And, um, you know, people can play with it. But I, I don't think you're ever going to get the same right. soul, if you will, the same heart. It's... It's a case of, um, you know, the old thing from the early days of computers, garbage in, garbage out. Not even garbage, but whatever you put in is what you can get out. Mm. You can't put in imagination. Well, Elon Musk is trying to upload consciousness into the Internet. Have you heard about that? Oh, yeah. And I'm like, huh, 
it's fascinating to see what can happen. What's interesting too, even though all this stuff is happening, all this ancient wisdom's rising. Yeah. Being given a choice to, you know, what are we willing to adapt to? Mm. You know, what are we willing to, you know, look at? And I think as a writer, we can write about it all and help people know have options or know they have options and here's where I, i'll do one of my favorite quotes from galaxy quest don't you people ever watch the show <laughs> I mean, have you not seen what happens they say terminator did nobody watch battlestar galactica the cylons okay <laughs> exactly and, and oh um, yeah and we've been doing robots uh, oh <laughs> In ancient in ancient Egypt, they had um, not quite AI, but they had a, sort of a robotics. In some of the big statues in the temples, the priest would crawl up inside of it with a megaphone type device, and the god would speak. Okay, and then you've got all the the little models, the automatons, you know, over the ages, and um, course the frankenstein story which is the same thing you create something and you know what seemed like a good idea at the time but oops <laughs> yeah people keep doing it <laughs> yeah yeah is it because well, i can or because they don't want to know what history was or they think it'll be different this time around or you know yeah, it's, it's hard to, well you know what i think it's part of that um uh, maybe lower solar plexus thing i can make it work you know i'm better than all those other people i can solve this i can make it work yeah <laughs> you might want to take a look at history <laughs> but people don't want to do that anymore they don't want to look at history anymore even it, it's so interesting it's like people seem to want to rewrite history you know Ooh, we're yeah. seeing seen that now in all kinds of movies you know and uh, I mean there have been countries that rewrite textbooks because they don't want the next generation to know what really happened you know yeah so how do we as writers help that I mean can we help that or are we subject to what you know the masses or the powers that be you know they decide no that's not going to happen you know how how can we share what really was or is, or is that even possible? You raise a really important, vital question for civilization and civilizations and cultures. I think what we may be seeing more of is uh, independent publishing, more independent filmmaking, However, it still is going to have to be out in the portals that are controlled by some of the big oligarchs. And the nice thing about, well, you participated in the L.A. Web Fest a number of times. And the, ben the benefits of it were you didn't have to go through the studios to make your TV series, to do your creative work. You could just make it and people could see it. So that independent production of media, and I think of um, books and of teaching is going to be one of the possible saves in the midst of all of this oppression. And we've certainly seen this before too, as you were talking about earlier, the rise and fall of civilizations. And when you've got the old establishment fighting for its life, the first thing it tries to do is to wipe out the intellectuals, burn the books, kill anybody who wears glasses, oops, because that means they might be smart, <laughs> rather than maybe they just need glasses, <laughs> you know. But uh, we've seen that again and again throughout history, and uh, we need to fight it. And whether it's just keeping on putting out your independent podcast, not not uh, checked or overseen by anybody else, presumably. You get to do it because you're the producer, you're the distributor. Right. 
So if we can hang on to the channels of distribution mm -hmm. with enough freedom of uh, access and lack of censorship, then I think there's still a chance. And there's always been underground press and there's always been underground meetings and underground teachings. When you were, you were mentioning a couple of times about how the information is more accessible now, the reason it used to be inaccessible was because the people who were teaching it were being persecuted by the establishments. So you had to keep it secret. And, and I, you think of how much more information is still hidden. Yeah. It may not ever come out, but. May not. And I got a real shock, as did my other classmates. We'd been in this um, metaphysics course for, uh, gosh, I guess about three years. And finished that, and we went into the next level of it. And in the first couple of weeks, the teacher said, okay, you know that thing you learned about X, Y, Z? That's not right. There's more to it. And uh, the parts are switched and the timing is different. You don't get that information until you pass an initiation that mm -hmm. shows that you are supposedly worthy of and responsible enough to have the higher information. Mm. So I always figure whatever I've learned, there's a whole bunch of other layers above me that I don't know. And, you know, everything we're talking about could be backwards. We only see so much, no matter yeah. how observant we are, there's still never the whole picture. Right. Yeah. Right. And it's like your truth and my truth, even though they're true for us, they're totally different. Mm -hmm. you know? and so I, I just find that so fascinating when people are like, this is the truth. Well, you don't know. <laughs> you know. No, you don't. You can't know. Right. You can't know. And just like there are like all these different religions, you know, and we're the true religion. Are you really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Says who? Oh, you're God. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> and meanwhile, you know, so it's, that's what's so fascinating, especially as a writer, there's all this information you can dive into. And of mm. course, you know, what you choose to do with it, you know, it's it's up to you. But like what well, you have grasped it onto and you've studied and you share and you teach, and it's like you're you're sharing that information someone wouldn't know otherwise. And that's like expanding their consciousness, whether they use it for their writings or their personal life. And I find that exciting. Well, thank you. What one hopes that they do. And and I also hope that whenever anybody, you know, reads one of the books or sees a podcast or comes to a class, that it sparks their curiosity and they go on their own journey of discovery. And then they take the information and interpret it through their own mindset and their own experiences put it into their storytelling and spread it out to others. Right. And, and who knows what evolves from that? Yeah. 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 And you, you never know. Once again, you can't, sometimes you do know, sometimes someone will come back and say, Oh, Sophia, you said this thing to me three years ago and I just put it into practice the other day and it was wonderful. And thank you. But most of the time we don't know. Well, that's okay. But you're you're putting it out there, and yeah. you're you're inspiring people. It's like you are being of service, and I think that's just so awesome. <laughs> so one hopes so. One hopes so. Well, thank you so very much. I greatly appreciate your time and your wisdom and your beauty and grace. Thank oh, you. thank you. It's been very enjoyable. Um, a good wide ranging conversation. Thank you. I mean, I enjoy this and I would love to have you back um, sometime, whatever works for you. Well, thank you. I, I would like that too. And there's so much out there to learn and to access. We're really fortunate to have the tools that we can learn so much more these days. It's really wonderful. And you know what you're helping people do just to come to your podcast and learn new things they might not ever come across otherwise. So this is good. And, and a reminder to people, you offer a free consultation, 20 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So 
be great for people to reach out to you and and see what can work out so that you yeah. can thank you i really appreciate being on the show thanks so much we'll talk to you very soon Pamela. thank you okay bye-bye